with his word. But they turn and they're devoting themselves now to the deceitful spirits who come as an angel of light and they are listening now to the teaching of demons. They don't realize it. They are caught up in this. The packaging is very deceptive. And this picture just really... It causes me to grieve. And I have a couple of my really good friends in here who just came to me last week. And they said it grieved them that some of the stuff that we were looking at, we were laughing. And we thought it was funny. And so I went home that afternoon, and as I was thinking about this week's lesson, the Holy Spirit really convicted me of that. Because I'm the one up here that kind of leads the emotions of the group. And I want to apologize because there's nothing funny about it. These people are being deceived. And some of them in that line are some of our prodigals. And so I appreciate any time that uh, you have a comment to me. I hope you know how open I am. I hope you know that I'm very teachable. And that if you can show me in scripture that I'm wrong, please show me. Because I'm always willing to change if I can be shown in God's Word. And God really convicted me that everything we talked about last week, it may seem funny to us, and it may seem ludicrous, but people's souls are hanging in the balance. And so I, I want to approach today that people get caught up in this, and who we should be angry with is the enemy. We're, our war, it says, we're not struggling against flesh and blood. This is a spiritual war. A spiritual war. And so many are getting caught up in it. So I want us to have more, as we go into our prayer time for the prodigals, it's more of a, we just really, we're grieving for these people. Because we want them to see the truth. And my daughter is in that line as well as some of your prodigals. And so I apologize to you for kind of leading us into thinking some things were funny because they're not. And we can all say except for God's grace, there go I. So it is a serious matter and lives are hanging in the balance. We know that the enemy is seeking whom he may devour. True? Yes. And he is devouring at this moment these prodigals. He is stealing from them. He is robbing from them. And you and I are to be sober. We are to be vigilant. And we are to, because he is going around as our adversary, and he is seeking people, and he's seeking my child. He's seeking some of your children, some of your grandchildren. He's seeking some of your spouses, your brothers, your sisters. And so we want to come to this and know that we are to be sober and diligent. We're going to stand in the gap, be faithful to pray that the light will shine in their darkness. So as I don't know what I was searching for, but this picture came up in my search. And as soon as I saw it, I thought this is really shows me that on the right side, do you see that it's in the light? Yeah but the dark side. And people make that journey across the bridge. Why? The mystical is very alluring. People, are, they're just fascinated by mystery and magic and those kind of things. Something different. Maybe they're an undiscipled believer. And they're not growing. They're not in the Word. They don't feel fulfilled. So they're seeking something else. And many are making the journey out of the light into the darkness. And they're crossing that bridge. And so I began to look at the person that's standing there in the center. And I thought, God, I want to be that person standing in the gap that will help lead people out of the darkness back to the light. Because that's what we want for our prodigals. They may not be caught up in New Age, but they're caught up in something. 
that is keeping them in the darkness and they're not living in the light like they should be. And so I just spent some time in prayer this week and I said, God, use me. I want to be a faithful intercessor. I want to be faithful to stand in the gap because we are dealing with people's souls and lives and it is a serious matter. Eternity is a long time. So, and then I just began to pray and I said, God, I want to be that person and I want to be one that will lead, help lead them from the darkness by my prayer support. Lead them from the darkness and they'll cross back across that bridge into the light of God's love and of the truth. Will you join me in that prayer? To be a person standing on the bridge, standing in the gap, and let the prodigals come to your mind more and more. I know people are sick. I know people are dealing with a lot of stuff in their lives, but we're talking about people's souls. And we are talking about their spiritual condition, which I think is more important than a physical condition. And we spend lots of time, our prayer list is full of people who are suffering with physical problems. And they do need to be prayed for, and God is interested in that. But I don't see near as many people on the list for their spiritual condition. And I believe that we are to stand in the gap and pray for these people. Y'all agree? Yes. Okay. Now, we're going to go ahead, and I'm going to sound the alarm once again. Because we are talking about the new spirituality. It's also called human potential. It is also called a spiritual formation movement. It has many different names. And we are going to talk about the practices and the disciplines today. Now, does the Word of God set boundaries for you and me? Yes, yes we have a lot of boundaries. And when we choose to go outside of the boundary of God's Word, we are going to be in trouble, right? We are. So we, but we've got to know the Word of God. If you don't know the Word of God, you don't know the boundaries. So all of this is for our protection. Just like when your parents or when you with your children told them they could not go across the street. You know, without you. It's for their protection. But what did they always want to do? Cross the street. They want to do it anyway. So that's, that's just the way humans are. Now, we're going to start with Colossians 2.18. This is a wonderful scripture for all of us as we pray for our prodigals. It's a great one to pray for them. He says, let no one keep on. It's in that arrow's tense. Let no one keep on defrauding you, cheating you, beguiling you, bewitching you, and robbing you of your prize. Are we not in a race running for the prize that is set before us? Yes. You and I have an inheritance that we cannot even begin to comprehend. Right? Amen. When we stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we give an account for the works that we have done in our body here, are we going to be at risk of losing part of our inheritance? Yes. He teaches that. Yes. He says some will suffer loss of everything. They're there, but as one preacher says, with their tail feathers burning. <laughs> They're there, but they have been disobedient. They have not allowed the Holy Spirit to sanctify them, train them into the image of Jesus Christ. They have gone out and just kind of lived for themselves. So we know from Paul's teachings in 2 Corinthians 5 that there will be some who suffer loss at the judgment seat. We're going for a prize. We're to stay focused, looking unto Jesus, the altar and finisher of our faith. And he says, let no one keep cheating you of your prize. You're in this race. In the Amplified, it says, let no one defraud you by acting as an umpire. And what does an umpire do? He declares you worthy and he throws you out of the race. Right? And then you are disqualified for the prize. He said, don't let anyone do that to you. The umpire, he's the, he's the one that is associated with the word beguiling and declaring you unworthy of the prize. He can disqualify you. Why? You didn't obey the rules. You didn't obey the rules. So, I want us to notice, though, as you go on in that scripture, the contestant does not cease to be a citizen of the land. 
like in the Olympics and, and, and all when you represented Greece or whoever you represented, if you were disqualified, you might not win the prize, but you still are a Greek citizen. True? True. Okay, same thing here. They forfeit, though, the honor of winning the prize. Now, I do not want to stand at the judgment seat and forfeit whatever Christ has for me. I don't. Yeah. When you stay focused on the prize and you think of what's ahead of you and you think of eternity and you're not focusing on the things of this earth, you're focusing on things that are eternal, that are not going to pass away. That helps you keep your focus and stay in the race. So... Uh, we go on, and it says in Colossians 2, 18b to 19a, He takes delight in false humility, and He wants you to worship angels. Now, part of the new spirituality is for you to make connection with your angel guides. There are games, there are card games, there are all kinds of things to help teach you how to connect with different angel spirits and angel guides. They have them for every facet in your life. They tell you God is remote and you have to worship angels to reach Him. This angel will help you reach God in this way. Another angel for another aspect. This is absolutely forbidden in the Bible. We are to not worship angels at all. We only worship Jesus Christ. So... This is one of the ways they get people interested. Don't you want your angel to help you? You have different angels out here. I've heard people talk about if they get a good parking space. I thank my parking angel. <laughs> so look at the word intruding. They said he is intruding into those things which he has not even seen. And he's vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, any kind of a man-made religion. And what is he doing? He's not holding fast to the head. Who's the head? Christ. Jesus Christ. So anyone who comes and teaches you or preaches to you about God, and they are not connected to him by faith, they're going to be speaking falsely about him because they don't really know it. So the word intruding is a, a mystical term in mystical religions. And it means to set foot in the inner shrine, to be fully initiated into the mysteries of the religion now. These are just different things that you have to do to become fully initiated. Thank God, as Christians, Hebrews uh, 4, 16, I think, we do not have to go through any kind of an initiation ceremony to get into the presence of God. There's nothing I have to do except Father. Yes. Yes. I come boldly into the throne of grace and I find mercy and grace to help in time of need. I don't have to go through any kind of incantation or any kind of sacrament or any kind of prayer of, uh, what do they call it, contemplative prayer. I don't have to go through any of that. I can be in His presence because of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, Paul's concern. What's his concern in all of this as he's writing them? Eastern mysticism. It's the belief that a person can have an immediate experience with the spiritual world. I'm going to give you an experience over here. But it's completely apart from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. We're going to give you an experience. And as I told you last week, I have talked to too many and read their testimonies online. Incredible experiences that are exhilarating. And Satan and his demons will give them one. Yeah. And what do they want? More. Mm -hmm. I want more of it. So, the false teachers in Colossae, that's why he was writing the letter to the church at, Coloss at Colossae. The false teachers had had some visions and they had made contact with angels. And I want to tell you and warn you that if you start doing any of these practices, there are spirits and angels out there that will respond to you. But they are of Satan. Yeah. And you do not even want to dabble. You don't want to do anything to, put, to get a foothold, for Satan to get a foothold in you. And what do they do? They're, they're bypassing the Word of God, but they have this encounter with this angel. And they open themselves up to all kinds of demonic activity. Now, demonic activity can oppress someone 
who is currently saved. I don't believe they can be possessed, but they can be oppressed by the demons. And what happens? They it peels away it peels them away from the sound doctrine of the truth of God's word. Now, the problem is in the United States, the desire to have these spiritual experiences that are rather mystical, it is on the increase. It is growing rampantly. It is permeating the churches, and I'm going to give you quotes from some Baptist churches, which really grieves me, but it is permeating many of our churches. That's why I feel it had to be addressed. And I believe it's something that maybe in another year or two we revisit and see how it's going. It's just something that we need to be aware of because it's beginning to influence the church. Even good evangelical churches. So, in Jude 1, verse 4, he has a warning. And he says, certain people have crept into your congregation unnoticed. Really? That's what he says. Certain false teachers are going to be creeping in. And listen to the words he used in a few of the different translations. <laughs> they creep in unaware. They're creeping in stealthily. And they're gaining entrance secretly where? By a side door. That's what that uh, uh, Greek, uh, in the Greek, that's what it means. So we have some people, they don't blatantly come in the front door, and we usually have guards posted at the back door. But they can come secretly in a side door and start getting just a little bit of deceit and lie going on in a church. Now, how often do we hear this statement? Well, you know, it looks good, it sounds good, a lot of people say it feels good, and it seems to be bearing fruit. So how can this be deception? Well, it is going to look good, is it not? Yeah. It will, and it will sound good. So the question that comes before us, do you expect there to be a sign that says, warning, deception ahead? <laughs> no, not at all. It's, it's never going to be easy to spot. We, we cannot expect it to be obvious. So why does the Bible keep referring to the false teachers and all these false doctrines? He says it is deception. He uses the terms, it's more subtle. It is crafty. It is stealthily coming in at that side door where we don't expect it. And it creeps in. So this is a, a quote from Barnes' commentary. He says, false teachers would not at first make an open avowal of their doctrine. All right, they're not, I'm not going to stand up here if I were trying to teach you something false and tell you I'm teaching you something false, right? <laughs> that would be crazy. But what do they do? Their teachings all seem to be in accordance with truth. But then secretly, they have some kind of an opinion that they will begin to gently weave in to the fabric of their teaching, right? And it will sap the very foundations of the truth of God's words. The Greek words that are used in that verse in Jude that we just read, the Greek word used means this. You lead it in along with others. See, so you'll have a lot of truth, and where is that little bit of deceit and lie? Coming right in, and it's woven into the fabric of what they are teaching you. Nothing could better express the usual way in which error is introduced. He says it's by the side, or it will be along with some other doctrines that are true. So, those who preach false doctrine to you rarely do it openly. True? true. You're not going to have a guy in his three-piece suit with his King James Bible standing up there and you uh, not being in him preaching a false thing to you. He is going to tell you that he's preaching truth, right? right. You, he rarely will tell you I'm preaching error openly. So therefore, what am I to expect when I see this? Deception looks good. 
It, the, the enemy will always make sure the lie and the deception looks good to everyone. So, the easiest deception is for error to ride in on the back of the truth. And that preacher, that teacher may be telling you a lot of truth. But at some point, little bits of deceit and lies are going to be woven into it. So here's our preacher. Alright? And he's preaching truth. And we listen to him or you listen to me. You listen to a Sunday school teacher, somebody on television, whatever. And they say, whatever I say, you say, I agree with that. That is truth. That's in God's word, etc., etc. So then what do you say? I think I can trust that person to always tell me truth. And what do you do? You let your guard down. Because you think everything that your pastor or whoever says, if this is true, then he's not going to tell me anything false. And I'm here to say, there is no one, no one person that understands it all. None. That understands everything. And that's why I say, it is your responsibility. When you hear me teach, when you hear your pastor, other teachers, you are the what? Berean. Berean. And you go home and you check it out for yourself. It's your responsibility. So, he begins to just throw in a little bit of error and deception, and it will come in secretly through that side door. Deception, they say, often occurs when there's 99% truth and 1% falsehood. But see, that takes root in the heart. It's in the mind now, and a seed is planted. So the driving force of the Protestant Reformation, they were trying to get away from all of this. They were coming out of the Dark Ages, and what was one of their mottos? Sola Scriptura. God's Word alone, Scripture alone, is all that we are paying attention to. The sufficiency of the 66 books of the Bible that were inspired by the Holy Spirit as men wrote as He inspired them, breathed out by God, that is all we need to teach us, to correct us, to rebuke us, to exhort us, to tell us about all the doctrines. We don't need anything outside of God's Word, really. That's right. Is that right? Amen. That's right. Now, so we don't need to come along as people are doing today. They're trying to reinvent the wheel. They're watering down the word. They are twisting it. They're adjusting it. Yes. And that's where we are falling into a lot of problem because the gospel has lost a lot of its power. When you dilute it and twist it, it's losing a lot of its power. Many of your new translations and I know I harp on this, yep. many of the newest translations are leaving out the blood. They don't have Yahweh in there, and they don't have Jehovah. Mm -hmm. You can get online and Google it for yourself and look at your version and then see what is left out from the original. And it will amaze you. So if people are reading a Bible and it's not talking about the blood, it's not talking about sin, where is the power of the gospel? So, we know that God's Word has full and final authority. True? Amen. And He says the wisdom of men is foolishness. That's right. And so when we start going after some, some new discipline, some new kind of way to pray or something that some man has come up with or taking it out of the Eastern religions, it is foolishness. And we are not to participate in it. Psalms 138.2, the last part of it says... You've magnified your word above your name. What does he think of his word? It is magnified above his name. So, we are to make sure that the sheep, I do my, under the power of the Holy Spirit as I pray to him, I want nothing more but to feed you the truth of God's word. So you, your duty is to pray for me that God will always lead me into truth. Your duty is to be a Berean. And if you find something that I'm saying that's not right, you come to me. I'm approachable. You can ask some that have come to me. I'm pretty approachable. And when we see it in Scripture, if I see I'm wrong, I will stand here and change it. Alright? That's our agreement. Okay. Now, we have a book called Spiritual Friend 
And it's written by Tilden Edwards, and if you read anything by him, you know New Age. Mm -hmm. And here's what he says. We want to get the Eastern spirituality, we want it to come into the West. Mm -hmm. Alright? So, what's the bridge to do this? We want to get Eastern mysticism and the Eastern religions over here in the West. Y'all want it? Here's the bridge to make it happen. Contemplative prayer. And it is rampant in churches. So he says himself, this is how you can get it started. Contemplative prayer. And here is their new spirituality goal. For an individual to achieve Christ likeness. Okay, that sounds good, right? For you to achieve Christ likeness, to become more like Christ, you're going to practice these certain disciplines. Okay, y'all following me? This is real important. It has provided a platform and a channel through which contemplative prayer and other disciplines are now entering our churches. Alright? Now, John MacArthur in his book, The Truth War, which was ten years ago, he said, rarely are there assaults on the truth a head-on attack. They just don't come out blatantly. They're going to work underground. And what are they doing in the foundation? Drilling little holes in the foundations of truth itself. It's invading the church like a virus. Like a virus, contemplative prayer is. He says it's like sub-microscopic pathogens in your body that are doing damage and you have no clue. Did you know cancer is in all of us? Yes. It's in all of us. Yes. And sometimes damage is being done that we don't realize until we get a bad diagnosis, right? We don't realize it's going on. He said it can invade the body for hours, for days, for weeks, for months, and for years before we're ever aware of it. So we want to look, I'm going to look, I think, at four or five disciplines. First one, letter A, is contemplative prayer. And here they state their purposes and goals. I'm taking this off of different websites. Uh, so I have their words right from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Number one is to focus on shifting and balancing your internal world rather than outward communication with God. Now, are we taught when we want to pray to God and talk to Him, we have direct communication. We say our Father and we're there. That's right. Okay, they are saying they want to get your inward uh, internal world uh, you're trying to become more Christ aware we talked about this last week I hope you remember you're becoming more Christ aware so that you realize the divine within you remember that from last week alright but you need to do contemplative prayer in order to awaken that and this is going to help your prayer life my prayer life is our father my father alright now, they, number two, they want to adjust your interior mental state with the awareness of God. All right? So you're, you're going to see the steps that they go through in a minute, and a lot of this will make sense. As opposed to, I just can reach out to God myself in prayer and have dialogue with Him instantly because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and He's our intercessor. Goal number three. So you will enter an altered state of consciousness. Remember what they want you to do. Into your mind. Become aware of the divine that is within you. And you focus on that. And that makes you more God aware. And you will find your true self. Because they believe that every one of us has a divine already within us. Right? We just have to get it out. Birth it. Alright. Because they believe that man is basically good. We really don't sin. We just have to come into that God consciousness. So, one method to achieve all of these goals that we just stated is through the use of contemplative prayer. And contemplative prayer uses first a centering prayer. Alright? Now, here are the steps. And once again, I'm not advocating this. I'm teaching for information and to make us aware. 
You sit comfortably with your eyes closed. You relax and you quiet yourself and you just think about love and love for God and faith in God. Step one. Next, you're to choose a sacred word. So I could choose maybe the word holiness. Because are we not wanting to become holy? A holy person. Okay. So I could choose the word holiness. And that best supports your intention that I desire, Lord, to be in your presence. And I'm open to your divine action within me. Okay, are you all following me? Okay, now you let that word as you're sitting in your quiet, you let that word be gently present as your symbol of your sincere intentions that whenever of your sincere intentions to be in his presence. Now, does this happen to you when you pray? My mind is wandering. Yes. <laughs> Not focusing real well right here. Lord, help me to focus. Yes. <laughs> you know, because I'm thinking about ABC out here. Yeah. You know, so when that happens here, Whenever you have those thoughts that are getting away from you, I return to my sacred word and I start saying holiness, holiness, holiness. If my mind wanders, I come back to holiness and that's my anchor. So are y'all understanding the, the steps? Good. Now, let's look at what they tell you. First, they say you need to quiet yourself. Of over 31,000 verses in the Bible, not one word tells you to quiet yourself. Ever. Not one. So is this something a man has come up with? Yes. It absolutely is. Now, stillness of mind. If I get my mind really still, and I'm just kind of in a, like, spedging out, I call it, that has no correlation to how I'm going to connect with God, does it? No. But this is what they're teaching. Now, you cannot love God with all your mind if your mind is empty. You can't. You are supposed to love Him with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. You cannot afford to have an empty mind trying to contact a spirit, trying to contact the Holy Spirit, and thinking because you're sitting there saying holiness or whatever your word is over and over that you're going to contact the Holy Spirit of God. No, you're going to be contacting a spirit that you don't want anything to do with. And that's the purpose of all of this. Meditation is not an emptying of my mind like some religions teach you. It is to fill my mind. I meditate on the Word of God. I chew on it. I read it in the morning. And I read it pretty slowly. And I think about it. And you stop and you pray and you thank God over something you just read in the Bible. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. And you stop and you thank Him for that. And when he says, I've saved you from all your life from destruction, and I thank him, I stop. I don't just read, 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 read. You meditate on it. You chew on it. Digest the word of God. It says in Psalm 1, your delight should be in the law of the Lord, and in that law you meditate how often? Day and night. That's what he told Joshua. I love this quote I found. Reading the Bible without meditating on it. It's like I used to do. Read my three chapters. Check it off. I did it. But reading without meditating, it's like trying to eat and you never swallow. Slow down. I, even if you read a, a much shorter amount, really chew into it. And when you see something that says, I've saved your life from destruction, stop and thank Him for that. And then you pray that for your prodigal. You know, you get in the Psalms and you won't get very far because your prayer will be quite long. It's praying the Psalms. They're wonderful to pray. Now, there's, I'm going to address this verse because this is the verse they hang their hat on. The only verse remotely close to a command to quiet ourselves has been hijacked by them. Psalm 46.10 Be still and know that I am God. So they just pull that out of there. The word still means you let go, you relent, and you cease striving. That's a whole different thought than just to sit still and empty my mind. This command was given in reference to Jehovah God, Yahweh, He is sovereign. 
over all the disasters going on, all over war. And what was he telling those nations? He's speaking to the nations that kept coming against his people. And he said, I am sovereign. And he said, I am the one who's going to be exalted. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. And that's what he was telling them. You let go and you cease striving. That's the context of that verse. Now, they tell you to choose a sacred word. There are no sacred words. Who is sacred and holy? God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the triune God, and anything He makes sacred like the Ark of the Covenant. Those are your sacred things, not some word. So, I choose a mantra and... Some of them were like, some of them I looked at, people just sit and they, they're silent and they are, had their mind empty and they focus on, I am holy. I am holy. And the more you say it, see, you visualize it and it becomes a reality. Your thoughts become reality. You can create it. So it's to shift your consciousness, and that is an overt New Age practice. If anyone is trying to get you to do that, that is not in God's Word. It is part of this new spirituality. A Christian's God is the triune God of the Bible. It's not some God I'm going to find as I alter my mind in an altered state of consciousness like I'm in a hypnotic trance. Now, they say the word or the mantra must be present in you. No, I am to focus not on a mantra, not on a word. Holiness, holiness, and I'm focusing. That's not going to make me holy. No way. I focus on Jesus Christ. Amen. And you focus on the Word of God. Now, what does this show me? This is something a man has created. He's written books about it. He's done all kinds of things. Why? Because people are going to be attracted to this. Because why? People want to do something. So, man is still in the vain, selfish business of modifying his own internal state for his own pleasure. Prayer is communication with God as you worship Him. A repeated word or me having a mantra, that's not evidence of my intention that I actually want to be in the presence of the Lord. Y'all agree? Amen. Now, they say you need to return to your mantra when you're thinking about, oh, I've got to cook this or I've got to go to the store and what's on my list and all these things I've got to do and everything coming up in my life. So I return to the word holiness, holiness. That does nothing because my anchor is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews tells us he's our anchor. That's what we hold on to. That's right. Okay. So contemplative prayer, it's a move away from the truth of God's Word. It comes out of Eastern mysticism. And it goes to this mystical form of Christianity, but a lot of people love to get caught up in it. And they tell you, you have a divine center. Does, that sounds good, doesn't it? A lot of people want to think that they have a divine center within them, not the old wicked heart that the Bible says, says that we have. So these disciplines will help you find the God that is within you, even if you're not born again. That's what they teach. Because you've got the divine center already within you. So they don't recognize sin. They don't recognize that you need a Savior. What do they recognize? I have a divine center within me. And as I practice these things, that divine center will be birthed and brought forth in my life. This is how I become more like Christ. Remember, who did they think Jesus Christ is? He was the teacher that came to show them how to do it. He was the example. He was the pattern. But he was not the Savior. So these mystical Eastern roots are going to give mind-emptying techniques. They'll tell you to sit in silence and empty your mind. Not a very good idea. Do little breath prayers. And to chant mantras. We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. My mind is to be full of the Word of God and to meditate on it day and night. 
And there's a warning for you and me. Any kind of a spirit, subjective spirituality. What's subjective? This is a man's opinion who has put together books. He's put together courses. He's put together DVDs. It's being taught in churches. But it's a man's opinion that draws your focus away from the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. And this will have disastrous results in our lives. And it derails your spiritual growth. This would be a person that might show up at the judgment seat of Christ with nothing. If they were truly born again, but they've walked away and they're heeding and devoting themselves to these spirits, what happens when you start doing these things that a man suggests instead of God's way to sanctify you and grow you? You're derailing and you're never going to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Because it's done through His Word and the power of the Holy Spirit as you present Him that empty vessel. Right? And you keep your vessel clean. So, Jesus says in John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them by Your truth. It's Your Word that's truth and it's the Word of God that will sanctify each one of us. Conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. Discipline number two. Letter B. The use of a labyrinth. Now, a labyrinth is quickly spreading and infiltrating much of the evangelical world. I googled this just uh, for information, and I found out there are 41 labyrinths registered in the state of Oklahoma. The closest one to you and me, sorry for you folks from Nowata, is in Nowata. There is one in Nowata. And that's the closest one I could find, and I'm telling you that's registered ones. Some states around us have as many as over 200. <coughs> so let's talk about the labyrinth. It comes from the occult, and it's been used for centuries in magic and in witchcraft. They used it to cast spells and to control and ward off spirits. Labyrinths are rooted in ancient mythology. Does this tell me that I should have anything to do with them? Okay, I want to go back. Can you see the picture? And I know I keep standing in some people's way. Hope you can see around me. Maybe. Okay, this is how the labyrinth started. And this is from Greek mythology. You had a beast that was the minotaur who was half bull and half human. And I forget exactly why he came into being, but it was a punishment for something. So what they do is they set this up and they made a labyrinth, which is kind of like a maze. And you walk this maze. And the, they put in the center this creature, the minotaur, that was half bull and half man. But he began to require human flesh to eat, and he became difficult to control, so they put him in this to imprison him. Okay? Wanted him in the center to imprison him. All right. Now, when he demanded that uh, humans be given to him, he wanted human flesh, humans were sent to the center as a sacrifice to him. Now, y'all just follow my train of thought because I found this very interesting. Now, this is the labyrinth that is on the campus of uh, northern uh, Oklahoma College in Tonkawa. This is the one that's on there. It looks very nice, doesn't it? Okay, so and you see a couple of people walking it, and we'll talk about the steps of walking. This one is at the University, uh, Central Oklahoma in Edmond. There are labyrinths everywhere, 41 of them in our state. There's a book called The Path of Centering Prayer, and it tells you that you can deepen your experience of God by walking these labyrinths and doing what it says. Notice that almost everything that is involved is using candles, maybe burning incense. They want that ambiance. Now, my question for us, is this something that you and I should be participating in? No. And the answer, I believe, is absolutely not, except I know that there are some Baptist churches who have put them in their basement. They are putting them on their grounds. They are putting them in their foyers. And so you can go online and Google it for yourself. I'm just stunned at the places that the labyrinths are becoming popular and asking people to walk them. Now, 
Here is the goal of the labyrinth off of their website. Transform the human spirit. Because we're going to use the labyrinth experience. It's a personal practice for people to be able to heal and to be able to grow. There's their purpose. Now listen to this because it jumped off the page. I should say it jumped out of the computer at me. <laughs> this is a tool, they say, to build community. Is one of the goals to bring us all under one umbrella? Yes. And listen to the next sentence. A labyrinth is used as an agent for global peace. Wow. Do you see New Age? Yeah. All over that. And I also see the coming of the kingdom of Antichrist. Yeah. All over it. It is a metaphor for the blossoming of the spirit in our lives. Now, labyrinths, they are a circle with a twisting path, and they wind their way to the center. And there are steps you do on the way in and then on the way back out. And you're to be meditating because what are we trying to do? Transform our spirit. So, contemplative prayer, meditation is all involved in this. This is the doorway between those worlds. You know, <clears throat> you and I probably do not sit and focus on that there is a spiritual realm out there where warfare is going on. I mean, I don't think about it a whole lot. It doesn't come into my thoughts a lot. But that is exactly what all this is about. And it's also the key to the metaphysical, which is very uh, intriguing to a lot of people. So, the labyrinth was an ancient system of wholeness <coughs> with a purposeful path. Now listen to these next few words. Purpose. A journey to your own center. And what's in my center? An wicked evil, wicked heart. Wow. <laughs> Not if you're new age. The divine within me. It's another means to work out the divine within me. And we take a journey to our own center, and then we come back out. It will create a sacred place. It is not a sacred place, but it says it will create to that which is within. What is within me according to them? A divine center waiting to come out. Center. Now, to go within, this is on their website, to go within is to search for my own divinity. There are millions of people walking these. And what are they hunting? They may not know it. They think it's just an innocent prayer thing. But their website states it's to search for your own divinity as you go to the center. So here are the three stages. The first stage is called purgation. And you walk to the center of the labyrinth. And while you're walking in towards the center, you are shedding the distractions of your life. Am I not emptying my mind again? Mm -hmm. Okay, so my mind, I'm emptying it again and getting clear. Now, when I get to the center, this is a uh, message of illumination. And I am supposed to receive a message of spiritual enlightenment because I stand there with my mind empty and I meditate and pray. These contemplative prayers, focus on your word, holiness, or whatever it is. Now, when you come back out, this is called the union stage. It occurs as you exit the labyrinth and it invokes your joining God, your joining the higher power or the healing forces that are at work in the world, whatever you choose to call it. This is not Christian at all. This is nothing in God's word. Many churches say, and here's what they say, now regardless of all of the differences that we have between us, and there's differences among us, the labyrinth is a path that we can all do together. Because we're all seeking that divine within us. This is another new age ploy. This, I regret to say, comes from the Baptist News Global. Look at the headline, which should jump out at you. The labyrinth is transforming prayer life. Now, it grieves me that that's in a Baptist paper. But... The labyrinth can do nothing to transform anybody. 
That's right. The Father. Only God's Word. That's right. And the Holy Spirit. And see, they think it's the Holy Spirit. See, a lot of people are doing these things innocently. Now, the ancient maids, this is from the Baptist News. The ancient practice which involves work, walking a maze while praying has become very popular among Baptists as Christians in general are adopting more eclectic spiritual disciplines. Mm -hmm. Wow! That's all outside of the parameters of God's Word. Every bit of it. Now, here's some quotes out of the paper from different people. It needs to be used. It is such a beautiful space. And so many of them are making them beautiful gardens and so forth. You know, very tranquil, very beautiful, and they're putting labyrinths in there. And so I did not know this until I started researching it. August 17th was National Prayer Labyrinth Day here in the United States. And it was based on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. See, you're looking at a man again and what he said and what he thought. Spurgeon says, when we pray, we enter the treasure house of God to gather riches out of an inexhaustible storehouse. That's what happens when we pray. Now, I'm going to the third discipline, which has been labeled Christian yoga. And I like this little girl's picture she says, there ain't no such thing. East is east and west is west. And if Christianity is going to re remain Christian, the twain should never get married. Now, the quote I'm going to use is from Time Magazine, which was stunning to me because it's not even a religious magazine. But this came out of Time Magazine. A fast-growing movement that is seeking to retool the 5,000-year-old practice of yoga to fit Christ's teachings. Now, there's a National Association of Christian Yoga has started this year. They met earlier in the early, uh, last January or February, and they are now certifying Christian yoga teachers all over the United States. And now multiple books and videos are even on the market. It is permeating churches. Now, Hatha Yoga is the type of yoga that is being done or promoted in the church. It says yoga is prevalent in churches now as a practice and as a business because it has become like a $10 billion business. They say spiritual, it is a spiritual and religious practice. This is off of their website. It's a spiritual and religious practice that happens to have a physical component. But all the techniques originated in Hinduism. Now, here's a quote, and many of the quotes I'm using, I have the references for you at the end of uh, the lesson. Many of these are from a lady that was a Reiki, Reiki, 20-year uh, master teacher and a yoga teacher. And so these are many of her quotes after she became born again, and now she, is, she teaches against it, no matter what you say. She says you cannot slap Christian music on it and have somebody stand and read a Bible verse and make it Christian. And I'll tell you what she says. The efforts to separate yoga from its spiritual center reveal that you really don't know the roots of it and what it, what it implies. Now, Hatha Yoga says... Prepare your mind and your body for meditation through posturing and breathing and shifting focus away from thought. Are we now going to that empty mind again? Yes. Okay. But you use your body as a ground for spiritual techniques to prepare the practitioner to be able to unite with the absolute. So here we're going on to like a, a higher power, whatever they want to uh, call it. Now, this is another way to awaken and resurrect the higher self that is within us. Yoga, the word means to union, means union or to yoke. And what is the goal? To obtain oneness with the universe through a process of enlightenment. Now, she says, you transform human consciousness to experience union or yoking with Brahman 
who is Hindu's highest god. And that is the purpose, and they have that on their website. Now, the sound om that they chant in many classes is meant to bring people kind of into that emptying the mind and kind of into a trance, they say, to join with the universal mind. God's command is we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind through his word. Now, the salute to the sun posture at the beginning is a salute in paying homage to the Hindu sun god. And then the namaste that they say at the close means I bow to the god or the divine that is within you as you say that. Now, there's some warnings here and all of these are quotes that I am just feeding back to you. People contend that they practice yoga in a neutral setting. They can even say, well, we have Christian music. All right, let's see what she says. This, this is wonderful. I mean, it's not wonderful. I don't know the word. The spiritual realm is activated just by the poses, regardless of your intent. That is what they say. This is from the one that was in it for over 20 years as a master. Just the poses themselves are going to awaken the God that that pose will awaken. And it pays homage to them. The positions are intended to shift human consciousness toward God consciousness and pay reverence to the objects and entities other than the triune God of the Bible. I keep quoting. And it's an idolatry with the ultimate goal of helping man step into his own divinity. See, do you see the, the same theme running through all? But remember last week I told you they say, you might choose this, you might choose something else, and you might choose something else. But they all tend to have this same goal. She says, if you yield your body as an instrument to any other religious system, you are consenting to the influence of whatever demonic kingdom is over that system. Here's a survey. I took a survey. And they, the survey said, the majority of Christian women who began Christian yoga said they began it to exercise and stretch. And we say there is nothing wrong. In fact, we all benefit from stretching and exercising, etc. Now, one year later, though, these same women listened to the poll now. 62 of them, 62% said, my purpose is no longer the physical. It's spirituality. They felt more spiritual because of what they were doing. And that became their purpose. If a practice clearly belongs to another religion, you and I are wise to hold fast to God's warning. What is it? The seducing spirit led to them falling away. The seducing spirit led to apostasy. And that's our prodigal's verse from 1 Timothy 4.1. Now we're going to talk about the last one that I have, which is karma, which I knew nothing about. I was really, uh, didn't know much about it. But this is very uh, new age. I just didn't realize it. So here is a survey from Pew Research that was just done in October about two months ago. 33% of professing Christians believe in reincarnation and karma. That is stunning to me. So, what is karma? It is a spiritual principle rooted in the Eastern concept of reincarnation. And if you can see the slide up here, you can see the people that they have a life here, and then they, they die, and then they're rebirthed, and they come back in a different form. And you're always trying to have a better life. And we're going to talk about the principle behind it. So, here it is. A person accumulates negative moral debt in their life. And then they're going to have to pay off in a future incarnation. All right? Now, I want you to know I have been watching a few Hallmark movies this week when I'm in the kitchen. And I've heard him talk about, uh-oh, he's collecting bad karma. And I mean, they're just jumping out at me. All of the things that are very new age in some of those movies. They're casting spells. They're talking to angels. They're acting like a dead person can come back. And you feel them all around you. Uh, a lot of that's very new age. So uh, 
I don't know where I'm going to go with that, but I've been watching some this week, and when they started talking about karma, and one of them said, well, maybe he'll have a better life next time. And I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway, you collect negative moral debt, and then you have to pay it off in a future incarnation. So here's the law of karma. Every action has an equal reaction either now or in the future. This is all rooted in Hinduism because karma operates in your lifetime and across all the lifetimes that you may have. You know, you're working on karma. You're adding good karma, the ne negative karma comes in, and you've got to have a balance here and come out good in the end. Listen to this statement because it jumped out at me. We are to live out our future as a ransom for the crimes we committed in our past or a previous life. Who's paying the ransom? Jesus. Jesus. No, with them. We are. We have to pay our own ransom for crimes we committed in our past or a previous life. Bad karma has to be alleviated through our enlightenment and us suffering evil. If I cast out evil, it's going to come back on me. So, and listen to this. As we atone for our evils on the wheel of karma. Now, I don't atone for anything. We are pay our own ransom and we atone for our own sins and our evil. Our cycle of birth and death will continue because of our karma. What kind of karma are you giving off? Until we finally become, in some life, God realized, and then we're freed from the cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what just got me. The phrase, what goes around comes around. Did you know that's rooted in karma? <laughs> How many times do we say that? Well, you know what goes around comes around. Mm. Oh. That's rooted in karma. So, let's look at this a minute. Hindu teaching that rests upon the idea there's a force in the universe that will balance the scales of good and evil in the world. And the idea that there's some force or law, some deity, that's making sure we are going to have returned to us in this life, the evil that we put out into the world is in direct opposition to God's word. It goes against everything about the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of judgment. In Jesus Christ, 100% of my moral failures were atoned for sufficiently on the cross. He paid it all. All to Him I owe. Amen. God's not going to have us suffer for something that His Son already suffered for and paid the price. Jesus paid it all. He gave His life the ransom for many. I don't have to ransom myself. He paid it all. He canceled the record of the charges against us. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. My moral debt has been paid in full. He canceled it. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. He bore what you and I deserved. Every bit of it. And now... Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no judgment coming against me by God or a universe because of sin. My sins have been cast into the depths of the sea. Now I'm going to give an account of my life and my obedience, but not for sin. So, this I got from a commentator. And this is something I am going to truly work on. If you hear me say it, you go like this. <laughs> what goes around comes around. It's rooted in Hinduism. Now, if I say that to somebody, as a Christian, what I'm really saying is, Jesus didn't atone for some of my sins. Yeah, that's what I said. Wow. Now, and I say, I say, God is holding those sins against me and He's judging me by returning evil. He's judging us by returning this evil despite there's really no crime left to be paid for because He paid it all. He was judged for all my iniquities. He was chastised for the sake of my forgiveness. He was pierced. He was crushed. He was beaten. And He was whipped. 
and there are no vices on my record that I've got to pay by enduring evil. I love the verse from this song. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give you an answer. But this is, I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. I don't have to do anything except accept him. You know the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us? <clears throat> I don't think we really grasp how deeply God loves us. So the New Age movement, we're going to move through this quickly. The New Age movement has a very strong foothold on our culture right now. Studies find that 61% of Christians believe New Age ideas. And I, I do say this is professing Christians. All right? Now, you can go to the bookstores, you can go to the libraries, you can go to Christian bookstores, you can look at children's books, and there is a wealth of information out there now on New Age. Teaching people how to use crystals, teaching people how to meditate, how to cultivate a higher consciousness, how to contact their spirit guides. This is a uh, man, an author, uh, ex Elkhart Toll, remember, uh, Oprah yeah. pumped him up really big quite a few years ago. He has a series of children's books called Milton's Secret. And there is a movie called Milton's Secret. And it says, uh, I think I have it on the next slide. Yeah, teaching children, you live in the now is the quickest path to end in ending fear and suffering. Here are some books I found, how to teach uh, meditation to your children so they can deal with their anxiety and their shyness. Sitting still like a frog, teaching children how to meditate and empty their mind to get their mind uh, slowed down. And then in the bottom there, there's 25 kid-friendly quotes for your children so that they will become this self-awareness that there is a divine within them. And then a book over here on the upper right, you with the stars in your eyes, and this is teaching a child how to uh, develop a cosmic consciousness and how to empty their mind, how to read their horoscopes, get involved in astrology. All of this is in the children's uh, sections right now. Now, this is nothing new under the sun, right? God is an impersonal force in the universe and that we are to cultivate a relationship with this force. That's what they keep promoting. God is an impersonal force. It's what you want to call Him. And how do we do this? Contemplative prayer, through meditation, through yoga. We're doing all these things to practice His presence. A book that has sold over 23 million is a Celestine Prophecy. And it is a, I read what it's about. You can Google it yourself and read what it's about. The Secret, which was uh, promoted by Oprah. Uh, the, the Life of uh, the Law of Attraction. You attract what you think. You can create your own reality. It has sold over 20 million. Uh, the book, Conversations with God, alleged messages from God teaching this new spirituality, has sold over 10 million. Mm. The research says just in October 2018, 26% of Americans believe a spiritual power exists in a mountain, a tree, and a crystal. 25% believe in astrology. 24% believe in reincarnation. 23% believe yoga is a spiritual practice, and 15% say uh, <coughs> they agree with consulting psychics, fortune tellers, your horoscope, etc. 40% of Americans practice meditation at least once a week. Do you know how many people that is that are making contact with the spiritual realm? It's a billion dollar industry. Greater than 36 million practice yoga, which is a Hindu and Buddhist spiritual practice. It's now a $10 billion industry in the United States alone. <coughs> Pew Research in October asked people four different questions. Four. Do you believe spiritual energy exists in physical things? Number two, do you believe psychics have reliable insight into the future? Number three, do you believe that reincarnation is essential to enable the soul to evolve to its divine right? Do you use horoscopes and astrology? Here's the results. 62% of the general public said, I believe at least one of those. 61% of Christians. 
He said, I believe at least one of them. And they only ask about those four things. This is straight out of the occult. People don't seem to want to hear what God has to say. They want to hear from someone who knows, like who? A psychic, a channeler, a palm reader, a card reader, a Ouija board, astrology, magic charming, or the spirit of a dead friend or relative. Atheism is not our problem. New Age is our problem. And the new spirituality is our problem. It's beginning to invade our culture and infiltrate the thought life of Christians. 67% of Americans believe heaven is a real place, according to LifeWay research. 45% believe there's many ways to get there, though. And one in five evangelical Christians say there's more than one way. 59% believe the Holy Spirit is a force, that He's not a personal being, and He's not part of the Trinity. As a whole, Americans, including many Christians, hold unbiblical views on hell, sin, salvation, Jesus, humanity, and the Bible itself. <clears throat> the New Agers want a Christianized vocabulary so you will accept it. You now don't have a Ouija board. It's an angel board. So you can consult your angels. This is one that's being put, that has been put out for children. Good beautiful colors, te teaching them how to contact their angels and their spirit guides. Angel cards, and there's games for them to play. You have a problem, you have a past life issue, and there's a game for them to play. How to connect with your angel cards. And then there's uh, Fiona and Michael, and they have all kinds of answers for you about this life or a past life. I found these three games, and these are, uh, one is a spinning game, and children play this, and then they have to practice doing the yoga pose that they land on. And then there's yoga cards, and they do the same thing, and then there's yoga dice. And then the whole concept is to teach, these are for children, to teach children how to start doing all these poses. Netflix came out with Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and they now have another one called The Evil Seductions of Sabrina, I think. They use spell casting and incantations. They use demonic manifestations. They have new cards for children with little rabbits and butterflies, so pretty, and it's their spirit animal cards. And then uh, Sephora was coming out with a witch kit for little girls. A beginning witch kit that had crystals and sage and tarot cards, or now angel cards, and they had to pull it, not because of the Christians. The witches wanted it pulled because it said it was demeaning to them. So it was pulled. A new study in 2018, we've got the population of self-identified registered witches has risen dramatically. People are getting very interested in astrology and how they align with the stars. Witchcraft practices are becoming mainstream. Witches now outnumber Presbyterians in the U.S. by 100,000. Wow. There are 1.5 million self-identified witches registered in the United States as of 2018 in October. It is growing astronomically, and as they grow astronomically, the Protestant Christian is decreasing. 27% of Americans say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. That includes 35% of Protestant Christians who have that. I am spiritual, but I'm not religious. Many people are praying to the spirit of the universe, using incantations and potions and spells and charms long associated with witches and witchcraft. We just read recently the spells that they tried to cast on Kavanaugh and also on President Trump. And what did they have in there? They were chanting around an altar using animal skulls that had dolls with those men's faces on them. It is prevalent. But I want us to be encouraged because we know who's winning. We know who will win Amen. in the end. And so I have for you on that back page, I have for you the uh, devotional that someone sent me from Oswald Chambers about the supremacy of Jesus Christ, and this was the day after last week's lesson. He says, the holy movements of today have none of the rugged reality of the New Testament about them. There's nothing about them that needs the death of Jesus Christ. All that is required, just have yourself a pious atmosphere, a little prayer, and devotion. 
This type of experience is not supernatural nor miraculous. It didn't cause the suffering of God, nor is it stained with the blood of the Lamb. It's not marked or sealed by the Holy Spirit as being genuine. It has no visual sign that causes people to exclaim with <clears throat> awe and wonder, Wow, that was the work of God Almighty. Like a transformation in someone who has come back after being in a dark pit. A transformation in a mother that was caught up in legalism. There's the work, the supernatural work that the Holy Spirit does in a person. Because the New Testament only talks about the work of God and nothing else. The New Testament example of the Christian experience is a personal, passionate devotion to Jesus Christ. Every other kind of so-called Christian experience that they're talking about out here, it is detached from the person of Jesus. He says there's no regeneration, nobody being born again into the kingdom in which Christ lives and reigns supreme. There is only the idea. He's just your pattern. He showed you how to do it. But Jesus said when He, the Holy Spirit, would come, He only testifies of Jesus Christ. All these spirits that they're contacting out there, they don't testify of Jesus Christ. Only the Holy Spirit does. So when I commit myself to the revealed truth of the New Testament, I receive from God. What do I get? Who? We have the Holy Spirit within us, and He begins interpreting to us what Jesus did, and the Spirit of God begins working in me He's the one changing me internally to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. He does the work as we yield to Him. The Spirit of God will do in me internally all that Jesus Christ did for me externally. I have given you the words, and this song is only about two and a half minutes. and then we'll be done.